So I'm going to go ahead and introduce myself for those of you who may not know why you came to class today. Um, I'm Lizzie Ofer. I've been a residential loan officer here in the Valley for uh, since 2008, but have worked in mortgages since 2002, so 20 years officially. So I actually worked in mortgages the last time interest rates were 7%. Um, it's a really interesting time to be in real estate. So I just a show of hands really quick. How many of you guys have been in real estate longer than two years? All right, so a lot of uh, newer agents that maybe haven't seen as many market shifts, right? So we're in probably what I would consider one of the most unique times ever. Like we have super high inflation, super high rate hikes, the fastest incline in interest rates historically that we've ever seen. We also have record unemployment. So we're basically at full capacity for employment. So, and people that actually own homes right now have more equity and more affordability, like what they currently earn to their current housing payments than we've ever seen, okay? So there's a lot of really bad media, right, that is being reported, and I want you guys to know the facts. So, so that you know that I'm a credible source though, just know that I have worked in the before the boom, the boom, the after the boom, the great recession, the recovery, then whatever 2018 was, because we had a slowdown, the pandemic, and then whatever we'll call this. Okay, so I've seen a lot of markets and I've been a top 10 loan officer in the country. So I've closed hundreds, honestly thousands of home loans in all of these environments. So I'm gonna give you tactics to be super successful in a shifting market, because even though it's harder to close the same amount of business or more, this is actually the best type of market to separate yourself as a thought leader and to gain market share if you're smart on follow. Okay, so who wants to close a whole lot of business? Yeah, is that everyone? Can I get a yeah? yeah. Okay, cool. Honestly, your guys' enthusiasm makes me a better speaker. Okay, so I need a lot more participation. All right, so things that you guys have to get correct about the market today, and I'm going to pull this up because I actually got this sent. So things that might make sense for you guys to sign up for, Housing Wire, there's a specific podcast with Logan Matashami. He's one of, I think, the best housing economists that there is. He breaks things down super simple. Logan what? Matashami. And I will explain how to spell that in one moment. Sorry to be interrupted. No, 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 this is great. Hold on. But he actually sent me some really interesting stats on housing. Because how many of you guys heard that there's a looming housing crash on the horizon? Okay. Now, how many of you don't know for sure if there is a looming housing crash on the horizon? Okay, cool. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna explain why there is most likely, honestly, I am not clairvoyant. I have no idea if there's gonna be like a catastrophe around the corner that would create a record number of homes coming onto the market that outnumbers the supply or the demand of people that want to buy this, okay? Right now, even though interest rates are historically high and we are seeing, you know, more and more inventory enter the market, it is still being met by qualified buyer demand. Okay, so that means that there's still enough people that can qualify at 7% interest rate to buy the current supply of homes. Now, what people do not understand, because everything is relative for the time in which the information comes out, right, is that we have had historically low inventory for the past three years. So when there were only 5,000 homes on the market, that was historically low, right? That is not a normal or even close to balance market. Now, how many of you heard people say how we're back to normal real estate? Raise your hand. Okay, anyone who says that to you does not know what the F they're talking about. <laughs> I need you guys to really get that and never ever say that, okay? The reason that it is nowhere near a normal market is what they really mean to say is this is a balanced market, which is what I just described. We have enough listings for the amount of buyers, okay? A normal market, guys, I've never worked in one, okay? But this is not the way that normal markets behave. Like a normal market, a seller wouldn't pay 9% closing costs. It is not normal. A normal market would not have 60 bids on a property. 
a normal market, people do not pay $30,000 over their appraisal price. We have had two abnormal markets back to back. Now, what it does require is for you guys to be an expert in real estate. Okay, so here's some housing stats that I also want you guys to know. Because these are the ones that matter. Okay, and he sent me so many charts. So hold on one second. So according to, gosh, hold on one second. So according to Logan, 85% of homeowners right now have an interest rate less than 5%. Okay, less than 5%. So if there was going to be a big housing correction, there would have to be a reason that a flood of people would dump their properties with a less than 5% interest rate with like more than 30% equity. <coughs> Please write that down. Because when someone says that to you again, that's the question you have to ask back, okay? I never combat, like I would never be like, you're wrong. Now, I did say that people who say it's a normal market are dumb. That I do believe. But like, I would never just go and say that piece of data is wrong, especially if it's a client, right? A client you always have to ask another question to, okay? Because they got that information from somewhere, probably the news, a place that they find credible or a person that they find credible. And so then you have to ask a challenging question. There's a book on this called The Challenger Sale, another great book for you newbies, right? That at makes people question their belief and if you get them to question their belief system right which this one is based on i have trauma because of the past recession that's where this comes from right they will then think of you as the thought leader and the data that you then present will hold more weight does that make sense okay so if you had 30 percent equity and a less than five percent interest rate chances are that mortgage payment is actually going to be less than whatever current rent is so if you were in a position where you had housing or money problems, would it make more sense to dump the cheapest housing? Okay. The other thing that you have to understand is that temporarily, right, we are like the government has made a decision to squash uh, real estate because it makes up 30% of our overall economy. Okay, did you know that real estate and real estate related verticals impact that much of our US economy? Okay, most people don't know that. This is also how I know for sure that we are protected as an industry. Okay, and we have evidence of this because they will do anything. It's called quantitative easing, right? That they will do anything to get people to start buying real estate, which is why they brought interest rates all the way down to the 2%. Okay, and that was because the Fed bought mortgage-backed securities, and they and they will do that again. We saw it during the Great Recession, and it lasted for, I mean, many many years. So it won't be just a couple of months. Okay, now so they've made a decision to try to squash and stop the economy. In fact, that was in their last press conference that they were going to do everything possible to slow down inflation, and then they would worry about kickstarting the economy later because they've done it in the past. So. For certain, guys, I want you to know, interest rates will be coming down, okay? What I cannot guarantee is where they will go down to, okay? Now, we have seen within the data that once they get around 5.5%, we see a huge pickup in activity. So we know somewhere around 5% to 5.5% is gonna be where things start to really pick up. And that is a, like a metric and a marker that you guys need to be paying attention to. So last week was a historic change in interest rates. We saw interest rates drop 1%, okay? We saw a pickup in application activity that will be reflected in next month's mortgage application numbers, okay? That's information for you guys to know about because this is when you start making phone calls to your database. And we're gonna talk strategies here in a couple minutes, okay? All right. So I don't believe that there is a housing crash on the horizon. There's not enough evidence for me that people are going to dump their properties. Just so that you guys know, we have also a record low derogatories. So most people are making their mortgage payments on time. And here is the other kicker. This is a data metric that I'll shoot you guys in this email. Um, majority of, this is the best 
time historically that we have ever seen where people's housing ratios to what their incomes are is like the best ratio we've ever seen. Typically we wanna see something under 30%, it's under 29%. So if you're part of that 85%, your income to payment ratio is the best it's ever been. Okay, so we know that lowest delinquencies, we know great amount of equity, right? There's, this is not the type of environment for uh, distressed sales, okay? Now, there's a big group of people also who believe that housing values are gonna drop, okay? I want you to look at this term. It's called the mortgage rate lockdown. There's a bunch of articles on this. Because interest rates are, majority of homeowners have interest rates below 5%, there is this thought, and we're seeing it in the evidence now, like if you look at the MLS listings, they're actually going down, like less inventory is coming up on the market, you know, as interest rates were more volatile. And there is this thought process that people will be less inclined to list their property because they don't want to buy another property with a higher rate. Mm -hmm. So what happens if we don't have a number of the right amount of sellers that enter into the market? Who can tell me what happens then? Guess. Lower inventory, high demand. Okay, so lower inventory, increased demand. So here's why there's gonna be increased demand for the same amount of inventory. Because population growth has also not stopped. Millennials are a very large population that is increasing their family sizes right now, followed up by Gen X, right, who is doing the same thing, right? These, these um, generations aren't already homeowners, and so they are going to be entering into that housing market Okay, and so they will be eating up the supply. Now, I don't know how aggressive, right, they'll be able to get things done, but we are seeing more and more sellers, at least anecdotally, I don't have the data on this yet, that are willing to, like buyers are willing to pay higher purchase prices to get the sellers to buy down concessions. Okay, so homes are still increasing in value, they're just not increasing in value at, you know, 30% a year. So also, also, not a normal stat, okay? <laughs> Like a good investment, guys, especially on real estate, is three to five percent. Okay, and if you look at real estate as an investment in just that perspective, just know that it's not based on your cash investment, right? It's based on the purchase price of the property, which actually means that your rate of investment, your rate of return for your cash investment, is way higher than three to five percent. Typically, you can realize a hundred percent return, so like you doubled your money anywhere between three to five years in historical markets, right? So the average rate of return, again, like I said, three to five percent. That's unheard of, okay? And you get the added benefit of living in your property, okay? So I just need you guys to know all of that stuff. So did I answer your questions on whether or not you guys didn't ask any questions, but if you came here with questions <laughs> on is there a housing crash on the horizon? Do you have enough things to say if somebody asks you? If not, let's talk about it, because this is why you came. Go so we'll go here and here. So I keep having buyers now tell me they're going to wait for the rates to go down. And obviously I can't tell them. But then I have other people saying that the springtime, they're going to go up to 10%. So here's the thing. Um, we are already starting to see signs that inflation is lowering. Okay, we had two back-to-back -back economic reports that showed inflation numbers lower. <coughs> One lagging indicator is unemployment, right? So we're waiting for those numbers to be more aggressive. Mm -hmm. But guys, there's like the top 20 companies that listed huge reductions in staff that just got announced, and that happens now because they're just about to talk about last quarter earnings or third quarter earnings, okay? So we know that unemployment is like, gonna happen right i think it was like well i mean twitter's is kind of funny because it's mostly related to elon Musk, but like 50 percent reduction in staff okay you got meta that just reduced like 13 percent you have amazon and google that apple said they were not going to hire next year they're on a complete hiring freeze right so we have big unemployment that's coming down it is unlikely based on that information that interest rates will continue to go into the 10 percent okay we're already seeing that because of that, like that information, that's what the what led to the correction from last week. Does that make sense? And that was when they dropped it. Dropped, <laughs> yes, because we got we finally got the first real economic report. Now what what my fear is, 
Okay, and I'm not an economist. I just want you to know I'm a self-taught person, so you can be self-taught people too, um, is that the measures have been so dramatic and it takes a long time to be realized. Like realize they started this in January, we are in November. Okay, so by the time they realize enough data that the economy has slowed down, I think it's gonna take an even bigger effort to get people motivated again. Like when we saw the Great Recession happen, it was like eight years. Yeah. So it's a big deal. So no, I don't think that interest rates will be in the 10%. <coughs> There is um, an article from Fannie Mae, if you Google it, go, write this one down, that predicts that interest rates will be at 4.5% between the second to third quarter of next year. Okay, And just say, you know, that's really interesting because Fannie Mae, who is one of the largest in insurers of mortgages, is actually saying that they predict interest rates will be at 4.5%. Where are you getting your information? When, at what point? At second, first to end of first quarter, beginning of second quarter. So next year. So next definitely year. not ten percent. <laughs> no, but there's a lot of people that say crazy shit. I'm sorry. No, they do. Keep it up. <laughs> <laughs> I know, like God, oh, this is recording. Um, yeah, so they say a bunch of stuff to scare you. Mm -hmm. Like, who pulled out ten percent? Do you know what I mean? Like, seriously, where did that number come from? Like, someone just like, oh, it's gonna be ten percent. The market's crashing. It's like, okay, please, please help me understand. Okay, so I know that in the future, interest rates will be low, lower than they are now. Okay, I don't know if that's five and a half percent, I don't know if it's six and a half percent, but I know that seven and a half percent, we're seeing really big, significant signs that people cannot like afford a basic house. So I do know that that's probably our, like a, the, you know, you have like an arch of affordability, we're kind of at the peak of that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it'll be interesting to see what happens, but it's not likely 10%. Staying in the 7% is actually more likely and having it be volatile like this is more likely. Okay, did that help answer your question? Yeah. Okay. I think they were saying 10% because they would have gone as long as they needed to go with the rates increasing until they saw inflation level. And it's starting to show signs that it's leveling, so it's not gonna get to 10%. So my thing is though, it's like, but who pulled out 10%? Like, and who thought that it would no, just I, never, I you know? Yeah. This is, but you have, but one thing I want to challenge though is that yes, that is the thought process, but like, guys, things do change. The same people thought that they would never be able to afford a house, that it was always gonna be so crazy. This logic is so, like, faulty. It's literally as good as, you know, if one person jumps off a bridge, are you gonna jump off a bridge? Like that, there's same level of intelligence there. You know, so we gotta be different, you gotta challenge those thoughts. One thing that I would also challenge that thought process is yes, you can always wait till interest rates go down, but realize when interest rates go down, you're going to be entering into the market the same time that everyone else thinks it's a good idea. And then I would use this. So we all know how much an Xbox costs, yes or no? Some are around 700 bucks. We have a general idea. So that that, well, I think a, a new one costs around 700. I bought a couple for my husband, so like, <laughs> I mean, they cost around 700. Okay, at Christmas time, okay, because of limited inventory, those things can go like 2,400 bucks. Okay, that's called market price. The same that time that like it's like real estate. We were paying, you know, Christmas prices for Xboxes for houses last year. Market price also dictates when prices go down. Like right now that there's less buyer interest, right now that there's higher interest rates, buyers or sellers are willing to do so much stuff again because of market price. So in this period of time, you can actually walk into equity. Like people are selling their houses for under what they're worth. And so does it make more sense to get a cheaper price and then maybe refinance later and then offer them solutions like a 2-1 buy down? And I'm gonna explain what that is in a, a little bit. Right, but I would always challenge that, right? So you're, there's always a prom queen for every environment, guys. Okay, the prom queen right now is like discounted uh, purchase prices, more concessions. If you are a first time home buyer, if you are a veteran, this is your market. If you have any kind of credit issues, this is your market. Like it's more difficult for you guys to compete when everyone else is interested. And I promise you when interest rates go down, guess who also comes back? 
all of the I buyers, they go right back into the market because the buyer interest has returned. So I would combat that with, yeah, are you willing to pay like way higher purchase prices? Okay. I think it's important that, that everybody understand that there's one word that everybody's using that's confusing everything, and the word is they. So who's they? I mean, you gotta, you gotta think, so, so Lizzie's been doing this a long time, she's been through all these buckets, together we've been through it, and, and you can't say, well, they're saying this, or they said this, it's people that actually have facts, <coughs> and, and, you know, there's a lot of people that, you know, look at a crystal ball, or read the clouds, or your hand, or whatever, and can tell you, oh, this is gonna happen. I think the truth of the matter is you gotta figure out who's got an agenda, and what their agenda is before you start believing what they say. So somebody, they said 10%. That's bullshit. That somebody just pulled that right out of the air and said, well, that's where it's gonna be. The truth of the matter is 5% is a magic number, and as soon as it steadies for 30 days, then everybody would be like, okay, that's where the rates are gonna be, but then the variable's gonna be inflation. So, and with <laughs> inflation coming down, rates come down. So you gotta be careful about who, who they, you've used the word they six times already. Mm -hmm. And it's like, who's, who's they? You gotta figure out who's they. Well, I'm going to tell you who my they are in a little bit. Okay? No, I didn't mean that disrespectfully. <laughs> no, 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 it's okay because it's, it's an important fact. But here's the other thing I just want to drive home. I don't know that interest rates won't be at 10%. What I'm saying is that in this moment in time, for the data that we have for today, nothing supports that. Does that make sense? Again, I'm not clairvoyant, but nothing supports that. It is unlikely for today. Okay. That's the truth. And that is the truth. <laughs> you had a question. Yeah, I think like um, a lot of people that I've talked to have been more concerned about like the macro economy. So they're looking at like oil prices and, you know, price of commodities, food. And they're like, well, inflation might have gone down now. But come winter, once, you know, you're paying more for your energy bill and you're paying this, then inflation is going to go back up. Um, and you know, because CPI goes up, and so they're like, what, like, how do you combat people who are so concerned about the macro? Those are so, such educated <laughs> clients, let me tell you, that is not the norm. So you must hang out in very smart crowds. <laughs> Here's what I would explain to them, is that in the month of October, when we should have seen CPI prices go up because of all of the storms in energy, we actually saw it come down. So that tells me, in and of itself, that like there was a bigger reduction than was reflected because of energy costs okay the other thing is that we we just haven't realized is we haven't heard all of the third quarter earnings for all of these big companies but we know they're bad when they're laying off all of these employees mm -hmm. like we know it's bad so yes i'm super concerned about food and electricity and all of those things like <clears throat> those are realized gains just know that the average consumer right guys the debt has increased 15 percent like people are financing in their gas and their groceries right now those are not our clients okay those people those people probably should go live with a family member or rent a room okay like i love them too and there will be a market for them but like right now we have to realize that like there is some, a real economic need. The people that are worried about the macro economy, though, um, they have to know those bigger markers. So I would say, hey, but these things are also things to be considered. Okay, And so I think that's also why the Fed raised it 75 basis points, and they're saying that they're going to raise it another 75 basis points come December. Okay, The thing is, is that too much? Right? We don't know, and we won't know, guys, for a while. But I can tell you that... You know, when you see like a hundred companies, well-known companies, reducing in staff, like we know that it, I mean, the bigger problem is now no one will be spending and they'll be scared. And every single human being in this room has trauma from the recession. Whether it was your parents that foreclosed, whether you foreclosed, you had a short sale, <laughs> bankruptcy, struggled, spent all of your assets, we all had issues, okay? And that's the last memory that we have. So it's hard to change people's mindsets. Like one of the biggest drivers in what happens with the economy, the real estate market, isn't the data, it's actually people's emotions. It's how do people feel about the market? And there's not enough thought leaders that actually talk about the data. There's so many people perpetuating fear. Like there's this guy, Ramit, the I'll make you rich dude, literally got on Twitter 
and said that if you get any of your financial advice from a mortgage person, you're an idiot. He literally discourages people from buying homes, right, because he thinks that real estate agents and mortgage people are scam artists. And what he fails to realize is that most of America, their biggest savings is actually realized in their home equity. Mm -hmm. Most people aren't saving money and investing it in the stock market. Most people buy a house, they own it for 20 years, and that's the nest egg that they use to retire. Okay? Those are the facts. But the person willing to call people out on the internet is this guy, and he's getting a huge following doing it. And what I'm trying to encourage you guys to do is to have an opinion to know the facts, and then speak the truth. So, but if you need help talking to those people, I'll get on the phone too. <laughs> Seriously guys, that's one of those things if you ever have an intimidated like client that you're not sure of, like this is a great time to introduce me as their loan officer. All right. You brought up a point uh, saying, you know, you know the data that you know today. Mm -hmm. And maybe kind of along the lines of the folks that you mentioned, I'm dealing with a couple of business owners and some folks up in the Midwest that are looking to buy their second homes for the first time and they think that maybe they did overreact and that we haven't realized the bottom yet. So I'm having a tough time navigating those waters. Do you have any thoughts on that? So here's what I always tell people. It's, it's really difficult to time the market. Mm -hmm. like, like Ray Dalio is like probably one of the only people that has kind of predicted the market, you know what I mean? And now he's famous. I mean, it's, it's just really hard. It's typically a look back number and you can only make the best educated information for real estate today. What I always tell people is to look at historical data. So real estate nationally doubles every 20 years. So if you bought your property for 300,000 in 20 years, you can sell it for 600,000. Okay. Inflation is typically somewhere around like 2 to 4%, right? So you account for whatever that is in, in reduction. But at the same time, there's a huge return on your money. And you've got a place to live, which means that, you know, you, you have the added benefit of that. So I would remind them that it depends on what they're, like, planning to use it for. Now, <coughs> like, everyone has different opinions. For me, I don't think that there's a huge market right now for people who are going to be buying vacation homes, to be very honest. But if let's say that they did, right, I would maybe look for opportunities that make it more advantageous for them. So there's a lot of people who did that move up strategy, who decided to retain their former primary residences and become landlords. That's actually a list of people that I would tackle and maybe try to do seller financing for those people. You know, typically if you have a second home purchase interest, you're buying with a larger down payment, you're solving a need for people who maybe want to offload, right, a second property. That might be more what I look for, right, and then you solve their problem with interest rate, getting a good deal. Yeah. So, like I said, there's always a prom queen for every type of situation. You just got to know what's my person's problem. Okay. All right, so now we're going to, did I answer all your, the, the market questions? Because I'm going to talk to you about strategy, because for me, my personal opinion is that for the next 6 to 15 months, it's going to be challenging. Okay, so not a normal market, which means that we have to do way more specific, directed prospecting. We have to spend way more money with our databases, and you have to have a way longer follow-up process for any clients in your database that are not ready today. Okay. So I have been a master at this. Like I used to deal with credit repair clients when I started. I used to be the loan MacGyver. I'm still the loan MacGyver, but like in secret now. Um, so for me, I used to take any client and all of the clients that the other lenders wouldn't qualify and I'd have to stay in touch with people a really long time. So that's how I figured out that it's 16 touches to really convert an old lead and that the sales cycle is 157 days for a not approved client right now. So write those down. So you need to follow up with leads 16 times right now and 157 days before they will buy, if they're not ready. 100 how many? 57. It's really specific based on our numbers. Now, we follow up a lot. So if you're not, don't have detailed follow-up systems, you don't have a CRM to manage this, know that those conversion numbers are probably gonna be a lot worse. So also write down if you don't have them, I need a good workflow process that lasts, right, six months, minimum. 
If you don't have a CRM for a workflow, write that down. I need a CRM. Okay. Now, when I mean volatile, right, so it means that this is the type of market that's looking for experts, so you have to be great on scripts. So I practice my scripting every single day for 30 minutes on the way to work. Okay, every single day. That's how I can just rattle things off to you, because I'm rehearsed every single day. I know this stuff. So you need to be. Um, I would recommend putting out a 30 second to 90 second reel of information every single day. And this could be the script that you are practicing. It's so important that you're putting out consistent content all the time in a way that isn't informational like that people could Google. Like it's not helpful in this environment for you to be like, top three listing mistakes, right? It's not, here's how to purchase a home. They can Google all of that, I promise you. What they are looking for is, why does it make sense now? How do you know that there's not a housing crash? Why do you think interest rates are gonna be four and a half percent second quarter, okay? Like that's the information that they're looking at. In order to come up with the best type of content for your people, you have to aggregate your data, okay? So if you do not have a database of 300 people, right, and this includes past clients, current <laughs> clients, uh, influential people within your network, right, business professionals, that's another step. I need you to write it down, I need you to get to work on it, because this is the list that we will tackle next year. So you said 300 clients of you know, business professionals, folks you know, what do you, what's your feeling on lists that are generated that through title with emails and phone numbers? And so that's a prospecting list, but it's not a database. Okay. So key, a couple key indicate like differentiators. A database is relationships. You know them, they know you, they like you, they'll refer you, right? They have influence. If it doesn't meet that criteria, they're either in a marketing list that you email to and invite to events, or they're in a prospecting group which you will call and cold call. Does that make sense? Yep. You have to have all three lists. Mm. Okay. You guys are great students, you're like, I love that. But 300 in a database. 300 relationships. Now, what you want to find out in that, okay, is what type of person is this? <coughs> do they own one home? Do they not own a home? Do they own several homes? Right? How long have they owned their home? Where are they at in their life? Are they married, not married, divorced, uh, retiring? Okay? And then you want to aggregate the data. So you want to know, like, where in town they live, right? What type of homes they have, right? Are they first time home buyers? Like what kind of thing? So when I did this, I realized the majority of my clients buy three to four hundred thousand dollar homes on the west side. They're millennials, okay? And um, they're first time home buyers, okay? So the information that I create, the stuff that I send to my database is for that. Now the information that I provide to them typically helps move up buyers, which is my second category. And because people hear me talk in an intelligent way, investors come to me naturally. Does that make sense? Okay, but the majority rules. So I've had people who did this that did sold 300 or $700,000 condos in Scottsdale. It's like, that's the information that you have to be providing. That's how you have to show up online. It's, and I'm gonna give you a strategy that will work. And then if you guys are interested and have signed up, I will email you some data points after this, plus a 30 day plan. All right, so when you get the information, okay, for who you have, I need you guys to figure out the top five problems or worries that this set of people has. Like, what are they scared of? And then, once you figure out what they're scared of, I need you to come up with a branded solution to their problem. And a branded solution, guys, so I deal with a lot of first time home buyers, I gave them a budget plan for how to save a down payment called Smart Sense. Okay? When you have a branded solution, you can do things like trademark it, which I did, right? And then you can develop other programs for it. Okay? But the thing is, when I talk about the Smart Sense budget plan, it gives it way more credibility because it is branded. Right, it sounds like a real thing, something I've, I've spent a lot of time on, okay? 
So a branded solution, if you cannot come up with a branded solution, you come up with a solution that you can tie geometry around. So one of the sales techniques that I use a lot when I teach agents is called the triangle of trust. Okay, so I teach, hey, you refer me in a great way, I'll refer you in a great way, the client will trust the both of us. Do you see the triangle? <laughs> okay, because I gave you the geometry to put behind it, you remember it. Okay, so if you don't have a great name, attach it to something with geometry. Does that make sense? This is really important in marketing. Like this is probably the best marketing stuff I learned, right, with getting people to remember things. The other thing is, if your branded solution can use alliteration, it helps people remember it. Okay, or if it's cheesy, it helps people remember it. So like Loan MacGyver, you know exactly what it does. Okay, Loan Doctor, right, you know exactly what that type of person's business does. Leave Lizzie A loan, right, it's funny, it uses alliteration, people remember it. Okay, so I just want you guys to know that. So you'll have these branded solutions, and then you're gonna show up every single day and talk about them. Okay, now it's difficult to talk about things that don't have an opposite for it. Okay, so when your solutions are like, I'm, I have such high integrity, or I have great communication, realize that not a single person on the planet is gonna market that they have shit communication and terrible customer service. In fact, they're gonna lie and steal, right? No one will do that. So it has to be quantifiable solutions. So like for real estate agents, they want to know that we close in 30 days. We have a 26 day close, right? The quantifiable is 26 days. The other thing is if you can throw in a guarantee, right, it also makes you that much more memorable. So our guarantee is a $500 on time close, right? So we'll pay that to the seller and the buyer. Okay, so again, they know that $1,000 will be paid if we mess up. And so you gotta give them tangible stuff that rhymes maybe with geometry. Okay, those are your solutions. All right, now the strategy right now is to show up every single day online. Okay, a reel every single day. If you can do something on YouTube, even better. How I come up with my scripting and my strategies, guys, is I start with a newsletter that I write once a week, typically on Sundays. I actually wrote mine, to, I'm writing mine today because I wanted to see what the PCI numbers came out at, right, to then follow up my email from last week, right? So I needed this data point. So just once a week that people can, can consistently get from you. And then that information, once it's written down, I rehearse it. I record a little bit of 30 to 90 seconds of valuable information that includes my client's problem and my solution, and I show up every day online, okay? If you can do that, right, people will know what, what you're about. They'll know why they come to your page. Now, what's interesting about this market is I always say 300 is the number for a good relationship. It might be 600 in a market like this because people are unmotivated to move because I wouldn't move out with a 2%, 3% interest rate, please wait. Okay, so it might be 600 people, which means that you have to ask your 300 people for one person. 300 people for one person. Now, the way that you do that is, well, first of all, if you don't have a database, start with your cell phone. Everyone has a minimum, I've only, I, the lowest number I've ever seen was 162 contacts, okay? That's the lowest I've ever seen. Most people have like 1,500, most people have a couple hundred. So start with A's in your phone and just start going, how do I know them? And then how can I provide this person with value, okay? So I did this exercise a couple years ago. The first person in my phone was named Aaron Seabaugh, or AA, right? It starts Aaron Seabaugh. He was a car salesman, was my client back in 2016, so I felt mortified that I hadn't communicated with him in several years. Uh, he was a friend of one of my really good friends, or the husband to one of my friend's sisters, okay? And I knew I wanted to connect with him because he was a salesperson, a person with influence that I liked, that I knew liked me. So I was like, what do I know about Aaron that I can call him and provide him with value right away? And I remembered that he had started a side hustle selling advertisements. And I said, great, I'm gonna buy an advertisement. This might cost me $500 to re-engage this relationship. So be better with your databases, <laughs> okay? So I call him and I say, hey, Aaron, he doesn't answer. Hey, Aaron, I'm really interested in buying an advertisement for my business. Could you please give me a call back? 
Aaron calls me back and says, hey, you know what? I don't actually sell those advertisements anymore. It turns out they didn't work. <laughs> okay, but um, I am actually trying to get into commercial real estate. And I said, oh, I said, oh, what else are you doing? I'm trying to get into commercial real estate. So said, Corey, I actually have a ton of contacts I'd love to introduce you to. Would you mind if I set that up for you? He was like, oh my God, I would love that. I set him up with three people I knew. And you know what Aaron said to me? You know what, I'm in the middle of my refinance with Desert Financial. Would you mind looking over my fee estimate and telling me if I'm getting a good deal? Guess who did that refi? Okay, but it started with, how do I provide Aaron with, like, do I like him? Did I like, did he like me? Does he have influence? Okay, how do I bring him value? Okay, so I didn't, I didn't even have to pay for the ad. Bonus. <laughs> okay, Aaron has actually become one of my top referral partners, and he's somebody I love to work with. Okay, so just know that that's how it starts. And it's an easy phone call to make when you're trying to bring somebody else value. Now, I know that we might not always know how to bring people value, okay? I'm not naive enough to sometimes you're like, I don't really know. So here's how it goes. Hey, Kristen, it's Lizzie. Hey, girl, you are always somebody that I've really respected, that I've really loved in my life, and I'm trying to grow my business by referral. I know you've heard how hard things are in real estate. And so I'm really just trying to expand my network. I love and respect you. And I didn't know for sure if I'm somebody that you would use for home loans. And this is like no pressure at all, but what would it take, right, for me to be that person for you? Or like what types of things would you like to see? So I'm, I'm calling you on official business here. I don't do the fake, how are you? How have you been, right? Because uh, look, unless you are their mother or their doctor, do you really care? <laughs> You know, unless we're real friends. I hate that when sales, the second a salesperson says, how are you doing today? I just want to hang up. Like they do not care. So I might say something like, oh, Kristen, so great that you answered the phone. I hope everything's going well. I'm actually calling you on official business. You're somebody I like love and respect so much. Right, did you hear how I did that? Okay, and I just go into it. Now, Kristen might say back to me, well, you know what, I see these great TikToks all the time, or oh my God, I love your social media, right? They might give me some compliments. And I'm gonna just make sure, right, that I'm the person, right, that I can count on them. Or I, but I'm gonna try to get some feedback. If they're just giving you compliments, chances are I just put them on the marketing list, okay? <laughs> People who don't give you real feedback are not bought in. They just don't wanna hurt your feelings. Honest, like you gotta know. Like my best friend, you'll know if they're gonna refer you or not, okay? But if you haven't spoken to them and they're just giving you tons of compliments with zero feedback, right, then I would ask, well, who have you been using up until this point? And then you'll find out some of their information, okay? And then just say, okay, well, what did they do well, right? And what types of things would you like? And then the idea, and write this down, this is the golden nugget, okay? is you want to leave every call, every meeting with a piece of homework to bring them back value. Like if you're not getting a way to help these people at the end of your meeting, you did it wrong. Okay, now the other thing that might happen is, oh, my mother-in-law is a real estate agent, so that's who I use. And I'm like, of course she is, everybody knows a realtor. I'm sure she's amazing. On the off chance she doesn't work with like you know, $300,000 home buyers in Glendale, I would love to be the person that you would refer. Do you know how many times I have like cut in because I give people an exact referral for me? I, very few real estate agents, truthfully, market well. They market to everyone. They market to everyone and then they show everyone the show me the money houses and they're like, look at me look good at this open house, <laughs> right? I'm not gonna make you raise your hand if you've done that, but that's what they do, where they're like, look at me, I just sold the house. Look at me, I just helped these clients. No one wants to help people that don't ask for help. Do you know what I mean? No one, like, write this one down too. Your clients have to be the hero in the story. Like, they're Luke Skywalker, you're Yoda. Like, you're the thought leader. Okay, you give them direction, but they're the success. They're the winners. They're the heroes, okay? Most of the time, if your marketing has been, look at what I did, you were the hero, no one wants to help you. People wanna get behind a cause, okay? So, 
We want to make sure that we are adding value to their lives. We're making these professional calls. We're figuring out who likes us, who doesn't like us, and we are giving people a direct referral. Okay, chances are their mother-in-law did not give them a referral, or everyone thinks that you deal with luxury clients. Like, that's the truth. Everyone's like, oh, she's so successful. Like, I make it a point to tell everyone I work this slums. I want people to know that's my area. $300,000 clients are my jam. Okay, because that's legitimately who likes me. Okay, I would never want people to think, and I don't mean the slums for real, okay? But I don't want people to think that I only work with the higher echelon because they'll never refer me. Do you know what I mean? And there's way more first time home buyers out there, right, than any other market ever. Okay? Cool. So once you have this, guys, we got a reoccurring marketing online every single day. You need to make about 10 to 15 calls every single day to your database. That's how many it is. 10 to 15 calls. So it's about four hours of prospecting. So two hours to a database and two hours to not met clients that you're gonna put into your database. Okay, so this is open houses, this is door knocking, this is prospecting, this is networking, you know, business networking. And I would network to people that have a real housing need. So who are industries that deal with real housing needs? Like who has to move in an environment like this? Okay, so renters whose leases are gonna go higher, okay? Divorce. Divorce, who else? Job change. Recruiters, who else? There's a job seekers, but. <laughs> okay, but who else, fun. I want you guys to start thinking. I need to turn on your reticular <laughs> activators, okay? No, seriously, people die in every market, yes or no? Mm -hmm. Okay, so probate attorneys, okay? People who deal in estate sales, divorce attorneys, divorce mediators, insurance agents who deal with renters, okay? Recruiters, HR directors, okay? These are all people that deal with people with real housing needs, okay? PTA moms, anybody who runs a preschool, you would be so surprised how many people have real housing needs. It's so super important that that's the area that you're networking in. Divorce attorneys, let me tell you, are just like real estate agents. They need CE hours, they need training classes, and they love to go to a happy hour. <laughs> okay? That's an easy thing, like learn from your loan officers. Okay? What could you teach a divorce attorney? Come on. What could we teach them? Mm -hmm. How could you add value to a divorce attorney? Well, just along the lines of what you talked about with the statistics and being the wealth of knowledge on the let's, let's go through this in an exercise, okay? Yeah. Because I think you guys understand me, yes or no, but I don't think we're turning, okay? So what does a divorce attorney need that you guys also need? Fine. Clients! Have you guys ever met somebody who wants to divorce? Okay, mm -hmm. so normally in real estate and in loans, I get those weird calls. It's like, hey, I just wanna know what I pre-qualify for, but I don't wanna add my wife to the uh, loan application. <laughs> yeah, I know you've got it. Hey, I just wanna know what my house is worth, but don't tell my husband. Okay, those are for real conversations that you have. The other thing is if you just started giving tips out for people that, hey, divorce is on the rise, this is an actual statistic, I, like no judgment, but there's a lot of things that happen, right, in a divorce situation that you need to know of when it comes to real estate. Yeah, I mean, look, like you can make jokes of it, but it is true, and the thing is, because it's such a taboo subject, how many real estate agents do you think are marketing towards it? Nope. But they said that 56% right, of people are getting divorced and that number is on the incline. It was like in the 40s <coughs> during COVID, okay? So just know, right, like you could, you could stand out. Okay, so things that I teach divorce people, right? So divorce attorneys, they need, oh my God, what awful marker color. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I should know how to spell this because I just had one, but apparently I cannot. Um, okay, so they need clients. <laughs> All right. So they need clients. What else do you think that they need to be successful in their career? Solutions. Like, yeah, so there's a house to sell in a divorce situation. What do you think you can offer? Divorce services. Divorce services. What do divorce services look like? 
write it down as a thing to think about, okay? So here's what I offer a divorce attorney. So in a divorce, guys, things that happen are they have to sell an asset or one person has to refinance, that's a thing. So you guys have your network to offer them of a loan officer who can help them get qualified so that they can have an easier process divorcing, okay? That's your network that you can offer them. The other thing is, right, you can do a net sheet for them. Like people do not know what they net when they are divorcing. And so when they are coming up with their settlements, right, wouldn't a net sheet on their real estate be really helpful to a divorce attorney? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Yeah, right? So you can do net sheets, okay? Now, write this down, because you're gonna have to Google this later. There's something called an equalization payment. So if their person is self-employed, or they own a business or they have assets where they have to equalize the other person, partner over time. So like it's like husband and wife own this business, husband's keeping the business, wife has to be made whole like for the next like five, 10 years. There is typically like, an, um, typically like a second mortgage lien that's placed against their real estate, okay? Do you think that somebody might wanna know what the house is worth before they agree to an equalization lien? Yeah. Okay, what can real estate agents do? Comps. Yes, comps. Right, so value. BPO. Right, value. BPOs. Okay. Now, on the lending side, I offer my network, right, of really great real estate agents that can help them with net sheets. I also help them come up with like what a closing cost scenario would look like for the other person to purchase. I also account for things like alimony, equalization payments, child support payments, right, to make sure that one, the, whoever I'm working with isn't gonna get screwed in their ability to purchase. Is that value? I also teach real estate agents how they can screw, or excuse me, uh, real estate attorneys. <laughs> <laughs> or there we go, divorce attorneys, dear God. Uh, how they can accidentally screw over their clients without knowing this information. Do you think that's a value? Right, and then I say, hey, things like, hey, you might be accidentally screwing over your clients with because you don't know mortgage guidelines. You would be surprised, like real estate, or excuse me, divorce attorneys come to a lunch and learn and they're the most prepared people that wanna know all of your information. Okay, we are the expert in this field and they take their clients' negotiations very seriously. If you can educate them and teach them how to prevent future issues, do you think that they won't be your referral source? And you know my favorite thing about divorce attorneys? They don't work after five. A lot of them don't work on Fridays or the weekends. <laughs> <laughs> right? So they're not gonna bother you, right? But they'll have great referrals and they will teach people that you will be available on Monday. Wouldn't that be awesome? Okay, now you're gonna take this exercise, right? And you're gonna say, well, what their, their problems are, they don't know net sheets, they don't know valuations, they need good referral sources, right? And they need leads, okay? You can be a solution for all of those things, and there's tons of lists. You can sponsor events, you can go to their networking groups, they open them up. I mean, I've sponsored a bunch. That's actually how I met my divorce attorney, I'm not joking, <laughs> right? So this is the thing, and like, you guys can be a really great referral source. Okay. Was this helpful? Yeah. Okay, because you need at least 50 of these types of people in your network. <laughs> this next market is gonna be tough, guys. It's gonna be tough, but the people who last here, the people who set their name here, that become thought leaders here, they're the people that are going to get the wave of clients that is coming to us in six to 15 months. Like, you don't understand, like sometimes it is famine in real estate, it is really stressful and we work a lot for very little. And then we have seasons that are complete feast. Like the last three years, I, I had more loans than I could do with, right? I mean, I was literally working like 15, 16 hour days. I mean, it is tough, every market is tough, but some markets you make a lot of money, some markets you don't. But this is the one where like, honestly guys, people get really quiet. Like real estate agents stop talking because they don't want to look bad. They don't want people to think they're wrong, you know? And so they stop marketing. And also during the holidays, like everyone stops marketing. If you guys could make your presence known right now, you will be the great topic or the person that everyone speaks to at your holiday parties. You know how many people come up and just straight up start talking to me about stuff I put online? Like I cannot, 
literally, I have a plumber at my house. I'm not joking this morning. And he's like, are you the mortgage lady? And I'm like, I am. <laughs> I am. And he's like, do you think it's a good time for me to buy? <laughs> and I'm like, just texting him literally about my clogged drain and, and his mortgage. It's like, it's so crazy. But like, that's how far your reach can be. Right? Like, people just come up to you to talk about the thing because you presented the information. Wouldn't that be an awesome business to have? Okay. Now, in real estate, guys, we get choices. We all start off as driven. Everybody knows that they know at least three to six people when they start their career. We're driven. We work super hard. We know what it takes. The open houses, the prospecting, the, all the stuff. Then we get super burnt out. And then we realize we have no commissions. And then we start working really hard again. Okay, that is a driven to drifting type of business. Okay, what I'm teaching you right now is not to fall into drifting because that's where everyone is going to be, and I need you to get directed. So it's the 15, 10 to 15 calls a day. It's the weekly email. It's the daily video right now. Okay, <coughs> if you can see 15 to 35 people a week, and that's the magic number, guys, depending on how likable you are, um, it might be 60 people. Okay. That is also a recipe. So we're 10 to 15 calls a day, 15 to 35 face to faces. That means you're going to networking events, you're shaking hands and kissing babies. Thank God, right this time. Sometimes I'm like, you kiss hands and shake the babies. I'm like, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the type of market we're in. That's the type of market I cut my teeth in. And I promise you guys, I did this when nobody could qualify for a home loan. Like, I was teaching FHA loans to anyone who had bad credit. I was hanging on to clients for two years until they could purchase. And I became one of the top 10 loan officers in the country. And before my sabbatical, I was the number one female loan officer in the country. That's what momentum can do for you if you are directed. And it is boring and consistent and all things. But guess what? It is so sexy to live a life without all this stress. Okay? And if you know you're going to be in business for two years, who plans on being in business in real estate in two years from now? Okay, great. So we have time to follow up with clients now today, right? Because that'll be the business we have six months to 15 months from now. Cool. All right, guys, we are at time. Is there any other questions that I can answer for you? How did you spell the last name for Jason? <laughs> Is that true? Jason or? Logan. Logan. Logan Madashami. Logan Madashami. M-O Madashami. It's like, if you kind of get it right, it'll pop up. Okay. <laughs> If you go housing wire, Logan, and then something, it'll come up, I promise. Housing wire is where he's at. Logan Wire. It's Lizzie Hofer. Lizzie with Lindsay. Lizzie Hofer. Lizzie Hofer. Lizzie Hofer. Lizzie Hofer. Lizzie Hofer. Lizzie Lizzie Hey Lizzie, let me throw something out. Yep. Um, by a show of hands, who in here knows what the very best day to do open house is in the year? Sunday. Oh, in the year? Sunday? I don't know. Uh, Black Friday. Black Friday. Oh, Without okay. question, it's the best day to do an open house statistically in Arizona because for Christmas, everybody that's from Boston or Chicago, they want to go home for Christmas, white Christmas, snow, all that. And Thanksgiving, they come to Grandma's house, yeah. and they go out and golf the day after. And they're like, Where, "Why do we live in Boston? How can we do all that?" And they'll go out and look at open houses. So if you don't have an open house schedule for next Friday, do it. Yeah. Telling you. Yeah. All right. Can I get a show of hands if I taught you something valuable today to make you more money? Cool. Because I'm not a motivational speaker. I'm a hungry loan officer, and I need your referrals. Okay. I appreciate you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome.